I'm Anna Carlson and we're here on campus of Minneapolis Community and Technical College. We're here discussing aluminum welding. This is the second video in a three-part series. The next thing we're going to talk about is welding electrodes with the gas tungsten arc welding process. Uh, there are several different types of electrodes on the market. Which one do you choose? Um, I have three different types here that I'll discuss in relationship to welding aluminum. The first one is a 2% thorated electrode designated by the red end. There's a lot of concern over the use of thorated electrodes in industry uh, because the thorium is radioactive and it does present a health hazard uh, when being ground. Um, the dust, if it's ingested, uh, can cause um, adverse health effects. Now, the other reason why we don't use it is on, for uh, welding aluminum is because we're using alternating current and we can get thorium spitting on the positive side of the wave. So typically 2% thorated tungsten not used for welding aluminum. The next electrode that's very commonly used out in industry now, especially for welding aluminum, is seriated. Uh, and seriated tungstens now are designated with a gray color, although it was not too long ago that they were actually orange. Um, we decided to switch over to the European standard of gray. Seriated electrodes uh, work very well both on the direct current side and alternating current side. Um, and so it's a great overall tungsten. What I would suggest is making sure that you purchase a tungsten um, that is a, 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 from a, a high-end manufacturer because that tungsten will perform better than the same seriated tungsten but from, uh, that might be a little less expensive from a, from a different manufacturer. So pay attention to the manufacturer of the electrode. The last electrode we have for welding aluminum is Pure, uh, and it's designated by the green end. And it will work on the alternating current side, and uh, it does work well for welding aluminum, but I would say mostly for thinner aluminums. Thinner aluminums, you're working with a lower amperage or lower current, and so the Pure tungsten will work fairly well in that low amperage range. Once you get into a higher amperage though, the pure aluminum doesn't hold its shape very well and you can get a fairly large ball on the end of it. Once that ball reaches one and a half times the diameter of the electrode, it really shouldn't be used. So again, pure can be used for welding AC, but mostly think about it for thinner materials. No matter which electrode you use, the preparation of the electrode is very important. Um, I prefer to sharpen my electrode to a point just like I would on the DC side. And then I let the current form a ball shape. Uh, and with many machines, you will still get a ball shape on the end of the electrode because of the positive side of the alternating current sine wave. Uh, other welders will sharpen it to a point and then switch their polarity over to direct current electrode positive and actually ball the end of the tungsten then switch back to the AC side, and this also works well. Um, some welders will just use the electrode right out of the box as is and let a big ball form on the end. And I would say if you're welding thicker aluminums, that's not a bad way to go. One electrode we didn't talk about was a, a zirconiated electrode, which is uh, designated with a tan color. And zirconiated uh, electrodes actually work very well on the AC side. However, they're much more hard to come by nowadays and very expensive. I think that's in part because of the other uses for that element, zirconium, um, in uh, electronics manufacturing. Today we're using this machine for to do our uh, TIG welding on aluminum. This is a Miller Dynasty 350. Uh, it's a great power source for uh, TIG welding. This uh, machine will weld on both a DC current and AC current, and today we'll be using AC. Taking a look at the control panel, the first uh, part we need to be concerned about is our polarity and again we have a uh, we have it set for AC. This does have a pulser feature uh, which pulses the current between a peak value and a background value. Uh, I tend to stay away from that when welding um, and I would say for the beginner welder it may be a little easier not to incorporate that uh, variable into your machine settings. We have a pre-flow, post-flow option, and we want to make sure we aren't using, we aren't going to use any pre-flow for this particular weld, but we're going to make sure that our post-flow is um, up to uh, the time appropriate for the diameter of the electrode and also the amount of amperage that we're using. 
Last but not least is this part over here. This is the uh, AC wave shape uh, uh, control. And we want to be very concerned with balance. Uh, balance is the amount of current that you have uh, both on the direct current electrode positive side and the ele direct current electrode negative side. This particular number right here tells us the amount of amperage that we have or amount of time we spend on the direct current electrode negative side. So in other words, our penetration. As you turn this up, you increase the amount of negative polarity and therefore increase the amount of penetration. However, what you're losing is the cleaning action. As we reduce the percentage of time on the positive side, we decrease the cleaning action or the busting up of that oxide layer that we talked about earlier. As we go the other way, and we decrease the amount of penetration and increase the amount of cleaning, what happens is the arc tends to wander. Okay? The penetration or negative side focuses the arc and gives us a nice narrow bead that gives us, again, good penetration to the joint. The more we are to the positive side, the wider the bead will be, the more shallow, and the less control we'll have over the arc. But the trade-off is we'll have a lot of cleaning action. So it's really the amount of surface oxides that you have on the material and how much you think you're going to need to deal with that, which will determine where you set your balance. But it's very important to pay attention to it. I typically like to have my balance, oh, around 75%. So 75% to the negative side, 25% to the positive side. Again, I'm welding on fairly clean new aluminum. If I had aluminum with a heavy oxide layer, I would probably decrease the negative side and increase the positive side. Now this particular machine has one more feature I want to talk about, and that is AC frequency. That's the frequency of the wave. If we think about the wave, uh, we, think about, we think about stretching out the wave into this very long shapes or compressing the wave into very short shapes, very short waves. And as we increase frequency, we compress that wave. What that does is it tends to focus the arc. So again, we can make up for a little bit of that balance if we're using a lot of cleaning action on the positive side with a higher frequency. I tend to like to run my frequency around 110 or 120 in general. From the frequency button, we need to get back to our all-important amperage. Amperage determines the amount of heat in the welding process, which is very important. So this big button under the dial here is for A, and we're running at 120 amps. After we have our machine control set, uh, we don't want to forget about the shielding gas. The shielding gas is uh, very important in any uh, gas tungsten arc welding process. And we're happy to use 100% argon. Uh, sometimes people use a m mix of helium and argon together, and that helium actually increases the arc voltage and generates a, a more heat energy to make the weld for thicker aluminums. It is a little more expensive, however, so we try and just use the 100% argon. We're gonna open the cylinder valve. I always like to stand to the side of the flow meter. So we're gonna open that up and I crack it open and then open it fully. And you'll see the gauge on the flow meter tells us how much gas we have left on our cylinder. You may have also seen that little ball pop up on the flow meter and that's gonna tell us how much gas flow we have uh, measured in cubic feet per hour. So what I like to do is hit the purge button on the machine and you use this knob on the top to adjust the flow rate. And I like to have the flow rate around 20 cubic feet per hour Anywhere between 15 and 20 is usually enough for most TIG welding applications. So aluminum is different from welding steel uh, in that aluminum is a, is a great holder of heat, holds in heat very, very well. Uh, uh, so that makes it a little bit more uh, difficult to control the heat input because it can absorb heat very rapidly. Um, it also cools down very slowly if left on its own. Um, the other consideration with welding aluminum is that it doesn't change color. Uh, oftentimes steel will turn red, orange, and yellow, and you have a pretty good indication that that's getting really hot. With aluminum, that doesn't happen. It doesn't change color. So the only way I really know I have a molten puddle is when the, when the aluminum starts looking wet. 
Now, this aluminum plate is on this very large steel table here, and this table will be a big heat sink if I started welding it as is. Um, I always like to try and isolate what I'm welding, so I think of it as a system, and I know how much heat I'm putting in to make the weld, not how much heat I need to put in to heat both the base metal and the table. And so, just take a very couple of T-joints here, make a very simple stand, now I have the aluminum up off the table and I've isolated it from any potential heat sinks. So I'm ready to weld this piece of aluminum. Uh, the first weld I'm going to make, I'm going to run at a fairly low amperage and we're going to see what we end up with. So as you can see, this bead is uh, fairly cold. It's got a very convex contour. It's not tied really well into the sides of the, of the weld metal. It also took me a, a long time to get started. It took a long time for that base metal to get hot and for me to get my puddle. You probably noticed that my tungsten balled up on the end at the beginning of that weld. So we're going to make a second weld, and we've turned the amperage up quite a bit. Uh, on top of that, the base metal is already hot, and so that will actually help us make a weld that is a little too warm. Okay, we've cooled the metal down now back to room temperature, and we've set our amperage at 100, back to 120 amps. However, just because we're at 120 amps doesn't mean we're going to make the ideal weld. In fact, we can make a weld that's too cold and too hot for a given amperage because we're using a remote amperage control, in this case a foot pedal, and that foot pedal varies the amperage greatly. So now, we're going to start by not having enough foot pedal. You can see that filler metal is balling up. There's my little puddle. And I'm very light on the foot pedal. And again, my weld's a little on the cold side. So I bring my foot pedal down. The bead spreads out. And the toes fuse in. Making a fairly decent bead. Now if I press it down all the way, and I move slow, you'll see that my bead's getting really wide, spreading out quite a bit. And I'm potentially getting burned through on the other side. You may have noticed that at the end of some of those hot beads, uh, the, there was a crater at the end of the weld. Um, with aluminum, it's very important not to leave a crater at the end of your weld because aluminum tends to crack under, under load. And if you leave a crater, that's likely to where a crack will start. And if you continue stressing that aluminum and, and loading it, you'll actually have that aluminum crack completely apart. So now I'm going to run a bead and I'm going to fill the crater at the end and be very careful to do that. As you can see, I took more time uh, backing off the pedal more slowly, and then I actually added a little more fill at the end of the weld to make sure that uh, that crater was filled. Here in this weld bead, uh, we can see several things. Uh, we can see the bead itself, and we can see one start-stop in the center here. 
Um, I also want you to notice that the bead color itself is, has this kind of shiny appearance, uh, except here at the end, which is a little bit wider. Um, now you also see this area around the weld, um, this white uh, looks like almost like residue. What that is, is that's the electrode positive part of the AC current doing its job and busting up the oxide layer. And so that's very clear that we can see that around the resulting weld. And then here we can see the brush marks where I cleaned the weld, but I mean cleaned the base metal. But even after cleaning, you can still see how much of that oxide layer needed to be removed by the, uh, the alternating current. Next thing we're gonna do is tack two pieces of aluminum together and weld a joint. Now, one disadvantage with aluminum is it's non-magnetic. So those magnetic squares that you may like to use to hold pieces into place won't work on aluminum. A lot of people will use clamps and other systems to hold aluminum parts together when tacking. Uh, it's very tricky to tack aluminum because it doesn't really wanna come together like steel or stainless steel. Probably because of the alternating current. Here I've just set up a couple pieces of steel to hold these two pieces of aluminum in place while I tack them. It's very important when you tack to direct the heat towards the end that you want to tack, gradually go onto the pedal, ease onto the pedal, but uh, you want to watch for that, that uh, aluminum to turn wet because again, it's not going to change color. Once you see it turning wet, start adding your filler rod. And just like that, we can make a tack very successfully using the filler rod uh, to help the pieces come together. Once we have one tack on there, we can just remove these other pieces of steel and it should stay in place on its own. At this point, we could also make some adjustments if we needed to. Otherwise, these pieces are fairly well aligned, so I'm gonna make the second tack. So I'm going to ease on the pedal starting at my tack, make sure I get the tack melted, and then I'm going to dip the filler rod into the leading edge of the puddle and move the torch along. Again, the key here is to move the torch at a uniform rate and to add filler rod at a uniform rate. If those two things can be done together, you'll have a bead with a nice uniform appearance. Again, pay attention, start backing off the pedal at the end of the weld. Okay, next I'm going to tack together this lap joint. Uh, again, I like to tack on the outside edge and not in the joint if possible. Then I don't have a tack to deal with. Next, I'm going to weld this lap joint in the horizontal position. Um, I'm going to place a fillet weld in this lap joint. The reason why this fillet weld is being made in the horizontal position is because this weld is being affected by gravity. It actually will tend to want to wander down onto the base plate. The other thing with lap joints is this base plate will take a lot longer to heat up than this edge. Uh, so I actually do want to concentrate my heat on the base plate first. And then once I have my heat and my puddle going, it'll spread out onto the edge of the plate. I'm going to stop the weld right there because as you can see most of this puddle is on the base plate and you can see that this edge right here is really all I'm taking of this top plate. Again that's the key. If I angle my torch like this and put most of the heat towards this edge it'll tend to melt away and the base plate will tend not to get hot enough. So the angle is super important here um, and as far as work angle goes again you want to be 
concentrating mostly on the base plate. I'll continue making this weld. Again, letting off the pedal towards the end of the weld because the metal is already very hot. And making sure I put a little extra fill at the end there so I don't leave any craters. So let's take a minute to look at these finished weld beads. This is the weld that I turned, had the machined amperage turned down quite a bit. And as you can see, it's very convex, and the toes aren't really tied in. The toe is where the filler metal meets the base metal, and you want a nice smooth transition at that toe. And as you can see, there's a fairly sharp transition here. These welds were the welds I made when I turned the machine amperage uh, very high for the thickness of metal. And as you can see, this bead was run very, very hot, even to the point of it cracking in the crater here. Uh, this crack is a result of the solid when the aluminum solidified and because it was so liquid uh, it solidified around the edges first but because it was so liquid in the middle and it stayed liquid for so long it actually pulled itself apart thus why we have a crack here. This weld was also made with the amperage very very high and you can see there's a fairly deep crater at the end of it. If we take a look at the back of the plate we can see that each one of these welds uh, has a large amount of burn through the backside. And there's that crack again that was on the front. It actually is cracked all the way through the base metal. Moving back to this weld here, you can see I had my amperage set at the correct amperage. But here at the beginning of this weld, I didn't have the pedal down far enough. And I got that, again, this very convex weld without a smooth transition at the toe. Coming down, I increase the amount of amperage by depressing the foot pedal, and I see that I have a nice bead, the smooth transition at the toe, and you notice it's a fairly nice shiny color to it. As I progressed into here, I had too much amperage. Again, my foot pedal was down very low, and because I was at the end of the weld, my aluminum was also very hot. So that's what I call a double whammy. Again, you can see the color of the bead is a little more of a whitish tone to it uh, than the shiny tone here. And this whitish cast tells you that you're running a little bit too hot. Again, a crater at the end of the weld, something you want to avoid. The next weld we're going to make is a vertical up butt joint. Uh, the vertical position is unique in that the direction of travel is often considered an essential variable. What that means is that the, whether you travel upward or downward can make a big difference in the amount of penetration in your welt. And of course, uh, that can make a big difference in turn in the amount of strength. We're going to travel upwards for this weld. I have my butt joint tacked uh, onto a plate, which is clamped into the positioner that you see here. I'm going to hold my filler rod, uh, and I'm going to fill my puddle from above. Uh, I'm going to have my tungsten and my torch below and tilted at a 15 degree angle pointed up. Uh, it's very important that you have a molten puddle on the base metal before you try and add filler. Uh, the tungsten is very hot and if there isn't adequate heat under the base metal, the filler rod will find the, hard, the hottest point, which will be your tungsten. And then you'll have a tungsten full of aluminum and you'll have to uh, take it out and resharpen. So we'll see how this goes. You can see there's a little keyhole that opens up as I progress upwards. I just want to make sure I put my filler rod in there. If 
again backing off the pedal at the end of the weld because of the heat. The size of the filler rod is also a very important consideration and filler rod sizes are measured by the diameter of the filler rod. These are all 4043 uh, aluminum filler rods, but they are different sizes. Here we have a 332nd. This is an eighth inch diameter, 316th inch diameter, and quarter inch diameter filler rods. The size of the filler rod depends on the metal thickness. General rule is you don't want to use a filler rod larger than the thickness of metal. So for example, we've been welding eighth inch material. We would want to use a filler rod that's an eighth inch diameter or smaller. We're going to weld some 3 8 inch aluminum. Uh, it's quite a bit thicker than the material that we've been welding up to this point. So we're increasing our amperage. One thing you need to watch out for with aluminum are possible contaminants, as we discussed before. And here you see this edge of this aluminum has been uh, painted, uh, marked by the, uh, by the metal yard at which it was purchased. So again, if this is an important edge, it's something that, uh, contaminant that needs to be removed before welding. I've tacked the 3 8 inch aluminum plate together, and now using a 3 16 diameter 4043 filler rod, and with my machine set at 225 amps, I'm going to place a fillet weld in this joint. One thing I want you to notice as I'm welding this is that first I went very slow at the beginning allowing that 3 8 inch aluminum to heat up. It took a little bit of time to do that. So my travel speed was pretty sluggish because I was waiting for the filler metal, uh, the base metal to me uh, melt uh, adequately. The second thing I'm doing with welding technique is I'm actually letting the puddle form in the base metal first and then adding filler metal. It's a mistake just to add filler metal into the base metal without having it melted properly. And this is very easy to do with thicker materials. You won't get the depth of fusion into the base metal that you want, and you'll have a fairly weak weld. So again, as you notice my, with my welding technique, I'm moving ahead, letting the puddle form in the base metal, then adding filler metal. Moving ahead again, letting the base metal melt, and then adding filler metal. Again, adding enough fill at the end and easing off the pedal will prevent craters. Let's now try making a weld. And as we make this weld, we'll change the balance from a high value on the penetration side all the way down to a low penetration value and a high cleaning action value. So in our resulting weld bead, uh, we have a sketchy start here, uh, not very much cleaning action going on, and a little bit of contamination in the weld pool. 
because we didn't have the uh, electrode positive side very high, as we turned up the electrode positive cleaning action, you can actually see the deoxidizing, uh, the oxides being broken up. Um, and you can see it going from a narrow band to a wide band as we go towards the end here. We had a pretty good balance in the middle, but then towards the end, the balance side was really much, much too high. And as you probably saw, the arc was erratic, it was difficult to control, and the beads spread out quite a bit. Now we're gonna try changing the frequency from a very low value, say uh, 60 hertz, um, all the way up to 200 or 250 hertz. And you'll see uh, and hear the difference in the weld puddle. So as you can, you could really hear the difference with this bead as we change the frequency from a lower value to a higher value. And also we see a narrowing of the bead because as the frequency increased, the arc became much more focused and resulting in a smaller weld pool. We talked earlier about the different types of tungsten alloys were available. And we talked a little bit about the pure tungsten being good for welding with alternating current at lower amperages, but uh, not holding its shape very well at the higher amperages. So I have a pure tungsten in the torch right now, and uh, I have the machine turned up a little bit. So we're gonna see how this pure tungsten performs at a higher amperage value. It's very apparent the difference between tungsten shapes after welding with 250 amps. The pure tungsten has a very large ball on the end and was very unstable as we were welding. The serrated tungsten still re retains its pointed shape pretty well and was much more stable through the weld. So TIG welding aluminum, it's not really any more difficult than TIG welding steel or stainless steel, but it's just different. Things you got to keep in mind is that aluminum's gonna retain a lot of heat. And so you're really gonna to have to back off the foot pedal at the end of your weld and make sure you don't overheat the metal. And always keep in mind there's an oxide layer that you have to deal with. And so make sure you pay attention to your balance control using alternating current. Whether it's TIG, wire feed, stick, or oxyacetylene, I've written a lot of my thoughts in this book, How to Weld. It's available at Amazon.com and Barnes & Noble along with other retailers. Uh, and I think it's a good reference covering much of the material that we've talked about in these videos and more.